On today's story session, two tales, one about magic self-centered twins and the other about Rube Goldberg-style fruit picking. These are the tales Johan Waterspring and Casper Waterspring and The Pair Refused to Fall. My name is Zach Stewart and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadowverse Story Sessions, the podcast about how brutally dark and totally insane folktales and fairy tales used to be, which in my opinion, just made them way better. So we're going through the original versions of Grimm's fairy tales, story by story. We'll figure out the lessons of each story, whether intended or not, and afterwards I'll adapt the tale into a movie or TV show. Today we've got two tales, because the first one is very short... But it's also pretty stupid, so we're not going to spend a ton of time on it, and we're going to move right on to the second. But it's still ridiculously hilarious, so we are going to get into it. All right, let's get right to it with today's first tale, titled, The Pair Refused to Fall. We begin. The master went to shake the pair, but the pair refused to fall. The master sent the servant out to shake the pair and make it fall. But the servant did not shake at all. The pair refused to fall. Well, yeah, if the servant didn't even shake it, then obviously the pair isn't going to fall. The master already tried shaking it, though, so why would having the servant shake it do any more? Is the this, this servant, like, super jacked and strong or something? That's a super shitty servant, right? For just outright refusing to do such a simple thing for his boss. Did you just walk out there and be like, fuck my boss, I'm not even going to try. And then just walk back inside? I don't know, get better help, buddy. Maybe a gardener for this particular problem. Or just, you know, wait. It'll fall eventually. We continue. The master sent the guard dog out to bite the servant with his snout. But the dog did not bite at all. The servant did not shake at all. The pair refused to fall. All right, all right. Well, firstly, that is super not okay to send out a dog to bite your servant for not doing your bidding. I mean, I mean, sure, the servant isn't following orders, but being bitten by a guard dog is a huge overreaction and way too harsh of a punishment. But thankfully, the dog also apparently has no interest in following this man's orders, so nobody's getting bitten. But I guess nobody respects this guy, even his own dog. And as a result, this pair is still up there. We continue. The master sent the big stick out to hit the dog right on his snout. But the stick did not hit at all. The dog did not bite at all. The servant did not shake at all. The pair refused to fall. All right, buddy. Just stop trying to physically abuse and punish people into doing your bidding. Apparently, this master is also a wizard, though, because how does he have a sentient stick that he can send outside and give orders. If he has the ability to give a stick sentience and mobility on its own, he should be able to get a pear down from a tree, right? I mean, maybe maybe he's not magic, and he just stood in the doorway and threw a stick at his dog, but missed. I don't know. I feel like this guy is going to need to be more proactive here and stop trying to kick off a chain reaction that will hopefully end in your dog biting your servant to compel him to shake a tree. This is, that's, that's just not, that's not a great plan, buddy. The master sent the fire out to burn the stick down to a crisp, but the fire did not burn at all. The stick did not hit at all. The dog did not bite at all. The servant did not shake at all. The pair Refused to fall. Okay, now fire is involved? Just calm down, buddy. And if you burn the stick to a crisp, then the stick can't hit the dog. Compelling the dog to bite the servant, thereby compelling the servant to shake the tree. Think this through, buddy. But, I don't know, it does say the fire didn't burn at all, so... What the hell even happened here? Is there just like a weird, sentient, floating flame going on? I don't know. This is getting weird. It's getting weird, buddy. We continue. The master sent the water out to snuff the little fire out, but the water did not snuff at all, the fire did not burn at all, the stick did not hit at all, the dog did not bite at all, the servant did not shake at all, the pair refused to fall. 
All right, well, if the fire didn't burn at all, then there's no need to send the water to snuff the fire out because it didn't burn in the first place. Oh, God, the logic of this story is collapsing into itself, and I'm starting to lose my mind. The master sent the little calf out to lap the water up, but the calf did not lap at all, the water did not snuff at all, the fire did not burn at all, the stick did not hit at all, the dog did not bite at all, the servant did not shake at all, the pear refused to fall. Again, if the calf laps the water up, then the water can't snuff out the fire. But the last few things would not start a chain reaction to accomplish the goal of getting the pair to fall. The calf lapping of the water means there's no more water. The water snuffing of the fire means there's no more fire. The fire means there's no stick. All of these do not serve the guy's end goal. <laughs> they're, just, they're just meant to punish the most recent thing for not doing what it was supposed to do. I'm definitely going insane here. Okay, the master sent the butcher out to kill the little calf. Come on, buddy. But the butcher did not kill it all. All right, I'm kind of happy about that. The calf did not lap at all. The water did not snuff at all. The fire did not burn at all. The stick did not hit at all. The dog did not bite at all. The servant did not shake at all. The pear refused to fall. Okay, now there's a butcher. So I'm just picturing the scene next to this fucking tree. A butcher next to a cow, next to a bowl of water, next to a small fire pit, next to a stick, next to a dog, next to a servant who's just defiantly staring back into the house at his boss. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I really feel like you gotta go out there and get involved here, buddy. Be more active. Don't just keep piling onto this mess of a situation and bringing more combustible elements into the equation. This could go so bad so easily. The fire, the fire is the most concerning thing, but I feel like the dog and the cow are also a potential source of conflict here, and then there's the butcher looming over everything. My god, just call a gardener to clip this branch or some shit. None of these things have anything to do with pears. They're just getting your servant to do the same thing you just did. That didn't work. Oh, God. All right. Finally, we have the final stanza here. The master sent the henchman out to go and hang the butcher. Oh, my God. So now there's murder involved. Now the butcher wants to kill the calf. The calf wants the water to lap. The water wants the fire to snuff. The fire wants the stick to burn. The stick wants the dog to hit. The dog wants the servant to bite. The servant wants the pear to shake. And the pear is ready to fall. The end. Wow. Okay, on its face, this one seems crazy. But I think I get it. I think it's basically saying things will happen when they happen. You can work yourself into a mess, trying to force something to happen, but the pair... The pair isn't going to fall before it's ready. Doesn't matter what you do, or how many elaborate things you throw into the mix, sometimes that pair is just not ready to fall yet. But now I feel like if that is the message, then the henchman thing shouldn't have worked, right? I feel like it was, it was setting up that poetic ending, but then just bailed on it at the end. I feel like the chain reaction should have been kicked off and somehow resulted in everyone dying, and then, like a week later, the pair falls. That would have driven that point home a lot more clearly and effectively, so maybe I'm not getting the message of this. Because as it's written, it kind of seems to be saying that only when enough people and animals and inanimate objects have been threatened with death and destruction, then things will happen. And I don't know if I agree with that. And if people aren't motivated, just add another person to threaten or punish the last person who didn't solve the problem. At some point, once there are enough people threatening to kill each other, then... Then you'll reach a threshold, and, and things will kick off, and you'll achieve your goal. Is that really the message here? Because that seems, what it's, seems to be what it's saying. And I feel like that's not, not a great lesson. <laughs> Once you threaten or endanger enough people, then you'll get the results you want. That's not, that's not great. I'm going to choose to go with my own version and interpretation of the story. But you know what? That's, that's what's great about these stories. They get you thinking about shit and getting creative and taking from it what you will. I'm sure other people can see other lessons to take from this, and that's awesome. 
I'd love to hear what those might be because this is batshit crazy. And I love when people interpret things differently. But you know what? That was super quick, so we're going to charge right ahead onto the next tale, which is titled Johan Waterspring and Casper Waterspring. Sounds delightful. We begin. A king insisted his daughter was not to marry and had a house built for her in the most secluded part of the forest. Well, that fucking sucks. I bet a lot of a lot of fathers have similar instincts, but that is a terrible thing to do to a person. My god, he essentially just imprisoned his child in the forest. Okay, we continue. She had to live there with her ladies-in-waiting, and no other human being was allowed to see her. Yeah, this is... This is just a low-key prison. At least she has some friends, though, those ladies-in-waiting. I mean, if they get along, maybe they don't, in which case this is hell. But they're probably pretty pissed off about the situation, right? The ladies-in-waiting, they've got families and friends, too. But no, they have to take care of this random girl in a secluded prison forest, forest prison, forever. If this was real life, then at some point, one of these people would go insane and murder the other people. This is this is the setup for a horror movie. We continue. Near the house in the woods, however, there was a spring with marvelous qualities, and when the princess drank from it, she consequently gave birth to two princes. What? She was impregnated by a spring? No, no, uh uh, no, no chance. Either someone figured out how to get to this forest house, or one of the ladies in waiting is actually the prince's boyfriend pretending to be a woman. Which is also a story I'd be pretty cool with. (laughs) That sounds fun as hell. We continue. They were identical twins and named after the spring Johan Waterspring and Casper Waterspring. Their grandfather, the old king, had them instructed in hunting, and as they grew older, they became big and handsome young men. Alright, well, did the king not have any questions about this situation? How how readily did he accept the explanation from the princess that the reason she was pregnant was because she drank from a magic spring? Because if I was that king, I'd want some proof. I'd want evidence. I'd be like, oh, so the, the spring is magic. Huh? What else can it do? What other magic powers does it have? Show me. Now. (laughs) Oh, no, okay, so it only does the crazy impregnating thing? That's fucking insane, but okay, we're gonna find a girl who wants to have magic babies, have her drink from the spring, put her in isolation, not in this secluded forest prison house, which I'm now incredibly suspicious of, and we'll see if she gets pregnant too. I would want some answers if I was this king. (laughs) And I'd be looking out to see if these kids ended up looking like anyone who happened to be hanging around at the time. (laughs) All right, we continue. When the day arrived for them to set out into the world, each received a silver star, a horse, and a dog to take on the journey. Wait, what happened to the princess? Because I'm, I'm still pretty concerned for her. Was she still kept prisoner in that isolated house? Even after the the kids left? I mean, she probably was, right? They can put her there so she would never marry. That sounds like it's for life. And then she had these kids, so I guess it's good she had more company, I guess. But now they get to leave? And she's still forced to remain in that house? That is fucked up right there. And now not only is she in prison, but she's losing her two children. My god, this is this is heartbreakingly tragic here. This poor woman. These two sons need to break her out of this place and take her with them. Save her. Save your mother. Justice for the princess. God, okay, well, I hope her story ends up alright, but somehow I feel like this story is probably just going to end up completely forgetting about her and only follow these two magic water children from here on out. That's usually what happens in these folktales. But let's find out. Maybe I'm... Maybe I'm jumping the gun and not giving it the credit it deserves. We will find out. So now, these two kids each have a horse, a dog, and a silver star. Whatever that is. It's a bit unclear exactly what that means. I'm assuming, like, a metal star brooch or something made of silver on their, like, coat? I don't know. All right, we continue. Once they came to a forest... 
Weren't they already in a forest? Whatever. They immediately saw two hares and wanted to shoot them. But the hares asked for mercy and said that they would like to serve them and that they could be useful and help them whenever they were in danger. The two brothers let themselves be persuaded and took them along as servants. Damn, that is actually awesome right there. So now they've got a horse, dog, and rabbit each. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And apparently these two rabbits talk? That's fucking cool too, and probably pretty useful. Soon after, they came upon two bears. And when they took aim at them, these animals also cried out for mercy and promised to serve them faithfully. So the retinue was increased. Okay, so they've got bears now? Damn, that is bad ass. To be honest, those bears probably... Probably could have taken them, though. Probably could have fought them and killed them, right? Two bears are formidable. And these two guys just have, like, a couple dogs and and, and rabbits and some maybe some bow and arrows or something. Two bears could, could wreck that crew. <laughs> but instead, we've got an awesome team of animals now, so I'm not complaining. If you're, if you're these guys, though, at this point, do you ride the horse or the bear? Because riding a bear would be awesome as hell. We continue. So the retinue was increased, and now they came to a crossroad where they said, We've got to separate here, and one of us should go to the right, and the other should head off to the left. Before doing this, each of them stuck a knife in a tree at the crossroad so that they could determine by the rust whether the other was faring well and whether he was still alive. Hmm. Not sure how that's gonna work. Also, does that mean they've got to backtrack all the way to this one tree to see if the other one is okay? And I mean, someone passing by could just, like, take either take the knives at any point as well. This seems like a bad and impractical plan. We continue. Then they took leave from another, kissed one another, and rode off. <laughs> I like, I like to imagine that kiss was just a super intense makeout session, and the bears and rabbits shared an awkward look between themselves at this incestuous makeout. But hey, they grew up together in an isolated house in the forest, right? They only had each other, you know? Maybe shit got experimental. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked in a way that I'm sure was not intended by whoever came up with this story. But hey, that's the fun of it. But regardless, I will move on. Johann Waterspring came to a city that was quite still and sad, because the princess was to be sacrificed to a dragon that was devastating the entire country and could be pacified only by this sacrifice. It was announced that whoever wanted to risk his life and kill the dragon would receive the princess for his bride. However, nobody had volunteered. <laughs> Man, I'm I'm assuming the princess had no say in this in this whole ordeal, her being sacrificed, and the only option out of it being marrying some random person. But being married to a random guy is probably better than death, right? Actually, I'll bet sometimes that's probably not the case. And if it's some crazy psycho who wants to fight a dragon, that might not be a super great life partner. I don't know. Why is that always the reward, though, in these stories? Save the princess and you get to marry her. Why, why is that always it? Why isn't it just save the princess and you'll get a big house and a bunch of money and an honorable title? That's a way better reward, if you ask me, to be honest. You don't, you don't know this fucking lady. Maybe you don't even want to marry her. Marrying a random lady is a terrible reward under pretty much any circumstances. <laughs> Stick to cash, guys. Maybe then, maybe then someone would have given it a go. I don't know. That, that is, it's also quite a blow to the princess's self-esteem, I'm sure. She's there just like, fucking nobody is gonna try to save me? Man, what's wrong with me? Just This is just a sad situation all around. All right, we continue. They had also tried to trick the monster by sending out the princess's chambermaid, but the dragon realized what was happening right away and did not take the bait. <laughs> Uh, I like that they included that in the story. Just like, yeah, they were trying stuff, but the dragon didn't fall for it. 
And how pissed off do you think the chambermaid was when she came back to the castle after that shit? Just like, fuck you guys. I've done nothing wrong. And you try to sacrifice me to the dragon? Ooh, they better they better have given her a promotion or something at least after that. We continue. Johan Waterspring thought, you must try your luck. Perhaps you'll succeed. And so he set out with his company and headed toward the dragon's nest. The battle was fierce. The dragon spewed forth fire and flames and ignited all the grass around them so that Johann Waterspring certainly would have suffocated if the hare, dog, and bear had not stamped out and subdued the fire. Animals can't do that. Maybe the, I mean, maybe the bear rolling around would have done something, but that hare would have been burnt to a crisp instantly amidst fire and i can't imagine a dog would fare much better regardless they stamped out the fire all right we continue finally the dragon succumbed and johan waterspring cut off its seven heads and then sliced its seven tongues which he stuck into his sack that was it. They they really glossed over the battle here. I see how they tried to make it work and make the animals seem useful, but I really can't imagine them helping much or how he was able to kill this dragon at all, especially considering it's a seven-headed dragon. And then he cut the tongues off and put them in a bag? Still must have been a fucking giant, crazy, heavy bag, though, right? Unless it was like a a tiny dragon, in which case maybe I can believe this more. I don't know. We're getting weird here, so let's just go with it. All right, so we've got a bag full of dragon tongues. Now, however, he was so tired that he lay down right at that spot and fell asleep. Okay, well, that seems like a bad idea, Johan. While he was sleeping, the princess's coachman arrived. And when he saw the man lying there and the seven heads next to him, he thought... You've got to take advantage of this. So he stabbed Johann Waterspring to death and took the seven heads with him. Ooh. Oh, damn. But what the fuck? Where are the bear and the dog and the hare now? Were they there? Wouldn't they have protected this guy or at least woken him up? They're not even mentioned. Fuck that shit. I have a problem. With that laziness, come on, guys, help him out. Whatever. We continue. He carried everything to the king and said he had killed the monster. Indeed, he had brought the seven heads as evidence, and the princess became his bride. Damn, what a dick. He took the heads, but I guess he left the bag of tongues? I mean... That's, that seems like, you know, the Johan's in, but also the king should be skeptical, right? Did this, did this guy, like, rub some dirt on himself or something to make it look like he, he was just in a fight? I mean, also, why did they send just this one coachman? That seems weird. Whatever, he's a dick who stabbed a guy who was asleep and he's married to the princess now. In the meantime, Johan Waterspring's animals had set up camp nearby after the battle and had also slept. All right. What? Why did they go off somewhere? Just to somewhere else? Just just to set up camp and sleep separately from Johan? I don't know. Who am I kidding? It's purely for plot convenience. There is no logic here. When they returned to their master, they found him dead. As they were looking, they saw how the ants, whose mound had been stamped on during the battle, were spreading the sap from an oak tree on their dead ones, and these ants immediately came back to life. So the bear went and fetched some of the sap, and he spread it on Johann Waterspring. Shortly thereafter, Johann was completely well and healthy, and thought about the princess for whom he had fought. What the fuck? So this is just chaos. <laughs> now, there was, there was a magic spring that impregnates people. There's a fucking tree with sap that brings the dead back to life. We'll make sure the, dra make sure the dragon is far away from these ants. All right? Because you don't want a crazy headless zombie dragon flying around. Whew. All right. Well, Johan is now a zombie boy and back in action. So we continue. 
So he rushed to the city, where her marriage to the coachman was being celebrated. (laughs) And the people were saying that the coachman had killed the seven-headed dragon. Johann Waterspring's dog and bear ran into the castle where the princess tied some roast meat and wine around their necks and ordered her servants to follow the animals and invite their owner to the wedding. What? Why? Does she... Does she not know that Johann had a fucking pet bear before? Before he went out to try to fight the dragon? That shit tends to stand out, a dude with a pet bear. Did Johann not go meet the king and tell them he was going to go get the dragon? I feel like... I feel like that's part of it. You gotta do that in advance. If he didn't do that, then why was the coachman sent out there in the first place, though? You know, when he, when he stabbed Johan. This is a mess. Also, if a bear and a dog charge into a castle, my response is not going to be to tie alcohol and roast meat to their necks and send them on their way and assume they have an owner. My response would be, oh my god, it's a fucking bear, everybody run. This is a this is a mess, but you know what? That's what I fucking love about these stories, so I am here for it. So now Johann Waterspring showed up at the wedding just as the platter with the seven dragon heads was being displayed. These were the heads that Coachman had brought with him. Don't know how he managed that, they were probably giant. But now Johann Waterspring pulled out the seven tongues from his sack and placed them next to the heads. Consequently, he was declared the real dragon slayer, and became the princess's husband, while the coachman was banished. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, I guess that's justice, but how did they determine this? Because one guy's got the heads, and the other guy's got the tongues. That is not definitive proof in either direction, if you ask me. And to be honest, I think heads trump tongues every time. How do you even verify that they're tongues from a dragon or from those dragons or that dragon? I mean, I guess you could like attach them and see like the the size matches up. I don't know. But they would, wouldn't they just look like gross lumps of flesh? Dragon heads, on the other hand, are undeniable and way more impressive than dragon tongues. Also, what was the purpose of the bear and the dog going in there in advance? Was that just to explain why Johan why Johan got an invite to the wedding? Because that's that's just hilariously forced. All right, the the, the tongues versus heads dispute is messy though, and I feel like they glossed over it. And I kind of want like a whole courtroom style scene where they litigate that one issue. We continue. Not long after, Johan went out hunting and followed a deer with silver antlers. He hunted the deer for a long time, but could not catch it. Finally, he met an old woman, who turned him and his dog, horse, and bear into stone. Whoa! Fucking hell, that went bad. Really fast. (laughs) I I thought Johan finally had it made. Damn, that is... That is some shit luck right there. I thought he could coast for a little while, maybe, after now he finally got justice, you know? First he gets murdered in his sleep, then he gets brought back from the dead, and now he's turned to stone. This guy is... This guy is going through it. Meanwhile, Casper Waterspring returned to the tree in which he and his brother had stuck their knives, and saw that his brother's knife had rusted. He immediately decided to search for his twin, and rode off. What had Casper been doing all this time? Can we hear about Casper's adventures? Because Johan, Johan's been real busy. What's what's Casper been up to? Did he just find like a party town and just chill and enjoy himself for a while? Because I still, still I would want to hear about those stories. Soon he came to the city where his brother's wife was living. She thought he was her real husband because he looked just like him and was delighted by his return and insisted that he stay with her. <laughs> that must have been super uncomfortable. Surely Johan must have mentioned he had a twin, though, right? They're married. That comes up. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the princess doesn't care and just misses Johan so much that she's losing her mind and doesn't care if Casper isn't 
isn't the real him. That must have been crazy for Casper, though. Going like, no, 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 I can't, I can't stay, I'm not your husband. Something is wrong with Johan, my brother, and I have to find him. And that, it would have been crazy, though, if Casper had just gone with it, right? If he'd just been like, uh, okay, all right, fine, yeah, I'm king now. It's, it's what you want, I guess. Johan did all the work, and now I can just coast and be king. Cool. Thanks, bro. Hope you figure it out wherever you are. That would actually be an awesome story, too. But no, Casper must find his brother because he is honorable. We continue. But Casper Waterspring continued traveling until he found his brother and animals all turned into stone. Soon after, he forced the old woman to break the magic spell, and then the brothers rode toward their home. What? Well, how did he do that? They're not going to explain that confrontation at all? I mean, it's crazy luck that he managed to find them at all, but now now he, he has to convince the witch to turn them back? How'd he do that? She's obviously more powerful than he is, than either of them are. If she took out Johan and his animals, then I'm sure she could do the same to Casper. Anyway, yet another thing they glossed over, and another interesting moment that we get zero information on. <laughs> so the brothers are now riding back toward their home. Along the way, they agreed that the first one to be embraced by the princess should be her husband. Well, it turned out to be Johann Waterspring. The end. What <laughs> the actual... Fuck, what an anticlimactic ending. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, first of all, why would they agree that the first one to be embraced by the princess should be her husband? Johan is her actual husband. They can't just decide to switch places without the princess's approval. I mean, okay, I mean, the princess did seem perfectly happy having Casper just stay and be her husband, which is pretty fucked up, to be honest. But now that Johan is back, that should no longer be an option. Johan killed the dragon and was already married to the princess. That's the end of it. <laughs> you, don't, you don't pull a switcheroo. Saving Johan does not give Casper the right to just take over as king or... Or as the princess's husband. That is... That is insanity. If the princess accidentally hugged Casper first, were they just going to be like, yeah, I'm actually Johan, your husband, but since you hugged him first, you're married to him now. If that happened, the princess would be like, what? No, you're, you're my husband. You're just giving me to your brother who I don't even know? What, do you not want to be married to me or something? What the fuck is your problem? <laughs> Even even though it worked out to be Johan, it's still going to be super awkward between Johan and the princess, who knows that Johan was prepared to just give her to his brother for seemingly no reason. <laughs> saving saving him from being turned into stone is not a good reason. Casper was just, just being a good brother for that. He shouldn't be like, I saved you, so you should give me your wife. But I guess he must have said that on their ride back, because how else do they get to the point where they make this psychotic bet? Just, just no, guys, you can't, you can't do this. That's not how anything works. <laughs> I know you grew up in some weird forest prison with your mom, but you can't just do that shit. Maybe one of them just happened to be standing closer to her. I don't know. They probably looked a little different, even though they're twins. The princess probably knows the clothes that Johan wears when he goes out hunting. Maybe they have different hairstyles. That weird addition at the end just makes no sense of the deal that they made and kind of diminishes how satisfying the ending is, if I'm being honest, because at that point, it's not a happy reunion between a husband and a wife. It's these two brothers making a weird sociopathic bet. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you're writing a story and the final sentence begins with the words, well, it turned out. That's not a strong ending. That is not a strong ending. It's pretty pretty wishy-washy, guys. I don't know how I'm supposed to feel about this story. So weird. So many weird things. There's like three separate stories in this one. The princess in the forest prison house, Johan in the dragon, and then Casper saving Johan. 
You can even add another story of like the boys growing up and have that be its own story. A lot happens in this story, but they gloss over so many interesting parts and sequences. And you know what? The first lesson here is going to be don't lose sight of the bigger picture because of your own shit. Because these twins leave and suddenly the original princess who was imprisoned in the forest is completely forgotten. I think there's a whole story just about her journey and her relationship with her father, who sent her to live in isolation. That is a harrowing tale, and we get absolutely no resolution, because these two boys want to travel. Then we completely ignore what Casper has going on, and never address it. That was, that was still like some of his first life experience since leaving home, so it would have been very formative and influential, regardless of what he actually did. For example, what compelled him to go back and check on the knife to see if his brother was okay? Did he get homesick? Did something happen that made him miss his brother? Who knows? But then after he saves his brother, which we still have no details on because they glossed over the confrontation with the witch, which is bullshit, these two brothers are so limited in their perspective that they make a bet between themselves about who's going to be married to the princess. If they thought for a second about the bigger picture or the repercussions of that bet, there is no way they could have gone through with it. These two brothers, these two brothers are so caught up in whatever they're doing at that exact moment that nothing else matters. Johan's wife isn't there, so who cares what she thinks or feels or how this will affect her and the entire kingdom, since the husband of a princess is not an insignificant position to have. Their mom is out of sight, so we never hear about her again. Is she just biding her time in the forest house until her death? What happens when her father the king dies? Can she be free then? Does she become queen? That'd be interesting, to see how a woman who lived in total isolation from an early age handles suddenly being thrown into a position of ultimate power over an entire population, especially when she's never even been in large groups. That'd be crazy. But no, none of that. Also, does she have siblings? Maybe she has a brother who becomes king. Does he finally free her and let her come back to the castle? I want that story. <laughs> but these, these fucking selfish magic puddle twins don't ever seem at all concerned with anyone other than themselves. So that's the main lesson I'm going to take from this. Keep the bigger picture in mind. And consider other people when making your decisions and living your life. It's a big world out there. Everyone matters. So don't treat other people like unimportant side characters who don't exist when they're not right in front of you. Man, all right, let's adapt this thing. So this one is going to be a TV series because there is, there's so much material here. And there are lots of sub-stories and minor plot lines that I want to see fleshed out. And we're also going to stick somewhat close to the original story, just change some, some of the framing and the focus and flesh out the storyline. So the original princess... In prison in the forest house, she is going to be our protagonist, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge from, from Fleabag. She is banished to a house in the forest by her father, the king, who will be played by Brian Cox from Succession. Because Brian Cox is like the guy if you want someone to be an authoritative but brutal king style character. And this begins the rivalry between the princess and the king, which will be one of the biggest conflicts in the show. In the original story, they just, they just completely move forward and never address the princess's feelings on the matter, as though she's just, like, totally cool with never being able to leave this house in the forest for the rest of her life. Anyway, she begins a romance with a messenger who visits the house, delivering a message from the king one day. And the messenger will be played by Donald Glover, because he's, he's just fucking great. And obviously, this romance is forbidden, so she and the messenger have to keep this secret. But one of the other servant ladies finds out, and she begins to blackmail them. And then one day, the messenger is assigned to a different title and position by the king, and given land and, and a new bride, and, and he is a subject of the king, so he can't refuse. And of course, this is, this is devastating to both him and the princess. And meanwhile, the princess's servant is still blackmailing her, until one day, in, in her frustration and rage, there's a confrontation, and the princess kills her. And she has to cover it up from the other maids, but but they're suspicious, of course, and don't know where they stand or how to feel. And there's there's lots of tension in the house and intrigue because one or two of the remaining servants are on her side, but some aren't. Some are like working for the king and more loyal to him. 
And then the princess realizes she's pregnant. But what's she going to do? And so she somehow manages to convince Brian Cox that it's a magic baby because she drank from a magic well. And of course, she is growing more and more resentful of her father, the king, as time goes on. So then she gives birth and surprise, it's twins who grow up in this house in the forest where they receive great education and training and everything since they're princes. But of course, they want to strike out on their own when they get older. But they also know that their mother, Princess Phoebe Waller-Bridge, is forbidden from ever leaving, so they're conflicted. And let's say when they're older, the brothers are played by Lakeith Stanfield, who is incredible. He'll play both brothers. We'll do it parent trap style, where he's where he's both of them. And by this time, we'll have Phoebe Waller-Bridge in makeup, so, so she looks older, of course, so the age difference looks realistic. So one of the brothers is more rebellious, and he wants to go explore the world, while the other brother feels obligated to stay and look out for their mother, and and he's like, no, we both gotta stay. And their mother, however, doesn't doesn't want her prison to be theirs too, and so she urges them to leave, which leads to a confrontation in which one brother, Johan, insists on leaving and exploring the world and living a life of adventure. And the other brother, Casper, tells the mother that He's decided he will leave as well, since she wants him to, but he will leave with the sole mission of killing his own grandfather, the king, so that Phoebe will finally be free to live whatever life she wants and no longer be a prisoner in the forest. And so the morning comes when Phoebe wishes the Lakeith Stanfield twins well as they set off from the house in opposite directions. But the Lakeith Stanfield twins, as they part ways, embrace each other, and they tell each other that if the other ever needs them, they will be there for each other, no matter how dire the circumstances. And that's basically, that's the premise of the show. Johan ventures off, adventuring across the world, while Casper is is plotting and ingratiating himself at the castle and trying to, to ultimately outmaneuver and outwit his grandfather, the king, Brian Cox, who is who is ruthless, but also a loving grandfather, so there's there's lots of internal conflict there. And meanwhile, there's still the simmering tensions between Phoebe Waller-Bridge and her servants. And sometimes, the Lakeith Stanfield twins get in trouble, and come to each other's rescue, or to their mothers, in the last moment, in the moment of need. And we haven't even gotten to the business with the dragon, or the witch turning people into stone, or any of that. There are so many places to go with this, and so much more emotional stakes and character-driven material here. Holy shit, I, I actually really want to see this show now. <laughs> I want this show to exist. And that will do it for this week's story session. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Also become a patron. If you like the show, then becoming a patron on Patreon would really help me continue being able to make it. Come on back next time for a story titled The Bird Phoenix. Sounds intense. Isn't that a little redundant, though? Can't you just call it The Phoenix? Maybe there are layers to it. I don't know. Come on back next time and find out. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions.